go ahead and get started. So hopefully what we have accomplished so far, and there's pieces of everything, when we get end up at the Trinity and we start studying the Trinity, there's little bits and pieces you're going to get from what we're studying, not so much up to this point. But from this point forward, when we start analyzing religions that are out there, polytheistic religions, which means the belief in many gods, and then monotheistic religion, and we're going to focus on Islam when we get to that. And as we develop those or just study them, um, it's going to help us in what I hope to do when we study the Trinity, realize where they miss out something. There's something missing some profound things missing in both polytheistic religions and is and monotheistic, the belief in one God religion such as uh, Islam. Then when we get to the, the, the Trinity, those pieces are going to help us with understanding the Trinity and why in the end, I would suggest that the only way you can have a true God is a Trinity. Okay? So we're going to get pieces out of both of them, the rights and the wrongs in, in both of them to develop that, okay? So, but up to this point, it was ba it's basically been, uh, you know, is there a God, right? And how the atheist, in my opinion, and atheists who become Christians' opinion, because they have a personal uh, testimony about it, that there isn't anybody that truly believes there is no God deep down inside, but that the atheist just doesn't want there to be a God. And this has to do with our natural knowledge of God, which we defined these last couple of weeks, a natural knowledge of God. Can somebody explain to me the natural knowledge of God, just so I can see whether you're, you're kind of getting a grasp of it. And this is a theological term that we as Lutherans and other denominations absolutely agree with. And you'll find, by the way, the natural knowledge of God in the scriptures. Although you don't need the scriptures to invoke your natural knowledge of God. That makes sense? But the scriptures define the natural knowledge of God. What is the natural knowledge of God? There is some, uh, some being out there that is bigger than us that there's something bigger than us, yeah, yeah. And and we're gonna call it God, right? Or some kind of divinity, right, good. <clears throat> what don't you need? What, what is it that you don't need and still you can have a natural knowledge of God? Faith. I would still say there would be faith attached to not Christian faith, no. Right. I'm, I'm really looking for something else. You're on the right track. The Bible. The Bible. You don't need the Bible. You don't even need God's word. That's the important thing to understand. You don't need God's word to understand and have a natural knowledge of God. Okay? <clears throat> Which tells you what? That, by the way, is the revealed knowledge of God. The distinction we make is natural knowledge of God and... Uh, revealed knowledge of God. Revealed knowledge of God is all Bible. Natural knowledge of God is just what we've studied so far, and it's basically common sense. Common sense. That's right. Common sense because you're here, right? And hopefully I've opened up the absurdity of being an atheist. Because to watch the atheist, like I said, to watch the atheists develop in their reasoning, which to me is, is like the proof in the pudding. You could boil it down to the atheists have to, if they're going to continue to try to be logical, the atheist has to say what? There's either nothing or God. Right. And the atheist has to say, we came from nothing. And that's what they're trying to prove right now. There's books on it. What's the problem? Like Lennox says, what's the problem? 
definition. They changed, good, you guys have got it. They, they changed the definition of nothing because there's always something. They never start with nothing. Because you and I all know it's very, very reasonable to conclude if in the beginning there was nothing, then there will always be what? Nothing. nothing. But since there is something, I mean, it boils down to that. Since there is something, the average person or just the logical common sense person says there must be something bigger than us when we look at creation. Right? Question, Jill. So is the natural knowledge of God nature and conception and birth and, and all that, is that yeah. part of it? Yeah. Yeah, it's you. I always look at it this way. You're on an island somewhere. You've never been handed a Bible. Or you're a philosopher, you know. Now, a lot of philosophers have this atheistic idea, but, um, you know, you, you just look around, and because you know that you're here and you didn't put yourself here, right? The most logical explanation is something bigger than you. Put you here. Either that or the other option is what the atheists are trying to say is there is no intelligence that puts you here. Okay. All right. So what I'm going to do now is further just, uh, and we're going to start getting into the religions, but I don't, I, I don't think I did it. Uh, I didn't give you what the scriptures say about this understanding of the natural knowledge of God. And uh, Francis Pieper, if you want to become a pastor and you go to our seminary, you have to know Francis Pieper, three volumes. It's our dogmatics, okay? I'm waiting for this to end up on, in the rummage sale because it's not... <laughs> It's not, doesn't read like a Harlequin novel. <laughs> but he is really good at, at systematically bringing the doctrines down to, so I got this from him. This is what we study, natural knowledge of God. We get it. First of all, there's three parts to it. First of all, we get it from the divine work of creation, and I can read you scriptures where the Apostle Paul says... For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. See what he's getting at? Being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. See that? You can see it in the nature. So the natural knowledge of God comes from the work of creation. Everything we've been talking about. Make sense? All right. It also comes from B, God's operation in nature and human history. You notice how that's in nature again. So the natural order of things uh, and you look, I'm going to give you two verses, Acts 14, now remember Acts, the first one was from Romans, so that's a letter that, that Paul was speaking to Christians. Now, this is um, being spoken of in a historical context of the book of Acts, because this is the Acts of the Apostles. Friends, why are you doing this? We too are only humans. This is where... Uh, people are starting to worship the apostles because they're performing the miracles of Jesus. And unlike Jesus, they know that they're not God, right? So they're, but they're still performing. And people are looking at them as gods very naturally because they believe in gods. Okay? We too are only human like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the here's the point. A lot of what they're doing here is speaking of the revealed knowledge of God. That's what they're going to get to. But look at what he talks about. Who made this God who what? 
made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. In the past, he let all nations go their own way. I'm not going to get boggled down with that verse because we could spend all day with that one, okay? Yet he has not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from the heavens and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your heart with joy. So what 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 is being spoken of there by the apostle is God has, even though you have not followed God, what has he done for you? By the natural order of things, he's given you rain, he's given you food, he's given you all the blessings of creation. It also says what? It rains on the just and the unjust, right? And the just and the unjust should recognize God for that. Not necessarily Jesus who died on the cross and rose from the dead, but this is your natural knowledge of God that he is invoking as he will then speak to them about the revealed knowledge of God, which is about Jesus. Okay. Another one from one man, this is Acts chapter 17. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. Now he's invoking history. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and we have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. So he's actually referring to poets of his day, which are not Christians, they're most likely Greek oriented where they affirm that there is a God who gives us these blessings okay that's all the what natural knowledge of God and then the third one is from divine law that is written on man's heart this is has everything to do with a conscience all right and the fact that you don't even need the Bible to know that, you know, killing somebody is wrong or raping someone is wrong or stealing is wrong. That's why around the whole world, whether you're Christian or not, most, well, all, basically all governments, even the Chinese governments, of course, have laws against these things, right? In fact, if you sell fentanyl in China and they catch you, they will execute you. There's not a fentanyl problem in China. Okay? But they realize that that's wrong and it's got nothing to do with Christianity. Okay? So, from divine written law, written on man's heart, and because of that we have no excuse, although they know God's righteous decree, that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. Indeed, when Gentiles, this is all both from Romans, so this is back to the Romans letter. Um, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. All right. So what Paul is developing there is if you're not a Christian, you should have the sense of what? Some kind of sense of right and wrong and some kind of divine law, which is very interesting to me. That's kind of like a basis thing, which, which, which Paul is getting at is there has to be objective laws, right? It makes me wonder how far our country has come from that. When there are so many arguments being made that try to force a subjective law that you could create for yourself here back in the days of Romans, when, when, when Paul is addressing the Christians from the Roman church, 
He's addressing both Jews and Gentiles because this is all about, if you look at the beginning of the book of Romans, um, he's going to, at the very beginning of his letter here, he's going to address the Greeks and their sin, and then he's going to address the Jews and their sin. So here, he's actually prom mostly speaking to the Greeks here and saying, you have these laws written and you know there's an objective morality. Okay? So if you live in a country where, like us, there is so much of our population that rejects a objective morality, and in place of it, there's this subjective reality, which is the, always the, def the defense for abortion. It's always the defense for various sexualities outside of God's norm. And now it's become the defense of this, you can choose your own gender thing. You can see that our country has really, really, really fallen away. At least a good part of our country has really, really fallen away from mm -hmm. just an objective reality of law. Not even right but these are all things that are part of just your natural understanding that there has to be therefore some kind of objective god right without invoking any kind of religion yet or faith yeah makes sense all right Now, we, 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 I brought this up last time, and I want to bring this up again because we spent that time with the ladders and, and the fact that by this time we should have two, two realities that everyone around the world has. Now, you may disagree with me, and that's okay. Atheists, maybe they don't believe in God. I think they do, but they suppress it. Maybe I'm wrong. All right? So if you want to take the atheists and put them aside, and then there's the rest of us on this planet, you're going to come across two truths that exist no matter which one of those religions that are out there you adhere to. What are those two truths? All right, not everybody. I, I want to get somebody else to answer. Young man. Huh? There, remember those two? Say that. There is a God and I'm not him. That's basically God, right? And then what's the other truth that we all know because we experience it? Life is hard and then you die. Life is hard and then you die. Always remember that. Because with those two realities... Now you have human beings philosophizing over those two, and you have religions being born out of those two realities that all of us know. Natural knowledge of God, and also life is rough and then you die. And so with those two, you're, 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 gonna have a, you're going to come up with conclusions. The Christian comes up with the conclusion that we have a loving, personal God. There are others that say we have a kind of benign God or a neutral God, and you're going to have to work that out yourself to where maybe you be, can someday become one with this God. Others conclude when they're not really attached to necessarily any religion, and this is what happens often here in our, in our culture, yeah, there might be a God. My life is all messed up. And for all practical reasons, I don't need this God because, finish the sentence. What about that God? Because life is hard. He's a mean God or he just doesn't what? Care. Or maybe I'm some kind of experiment to get, because to, to satisfy God's kicks and see if I can somehow survive. But I'm you know, coming underwater and, it, and life is really hard and why should I even care about God? Because he doesn't care for me. 
that you hear all the time. And the big objection to Christianity usually turns into God's responsible for hell <coughs> and we're responsible for righteousness. And then you get all of the talk about, you know, your God is so evil and mean or the Old Testament God is so evil and mean and stuff like that. Or you come to a text where Jesus says like he did in our gospel lesson this last Sunday, just yesterday, right? Hell is a place where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And they misinterpret the truth about the reason why that all exists. All right? So you're basically, there's a God and who cares because he doesn't care for me. There is a, there is a God, so give me the steps of good living so that I can appease the God somehow and be on his side or in his favor, right? And you and I know as Christians, there is a God. He is the triune God. And he loves us. And he created us for eternity with him in his kingdom. And the reason why life is the way it is is because of our disobedience to God. Yes, Jim? Don't get mad at me for saying this, but, or at least we're kind of going this way. No. But does this show that there are no other beings in life? I mean... You know, what does this say about other beings? Right behind the pole. Yeah. <laughs> Are you hiding from me? No. I, I, think, I think you're trying to hide from me. Oh, I'm trying to hide from you. <laughs> yeah. Say it again, I'm sorry. But I know you're skinny because that pole does cover you. Well, you're covered too. <laughs> you, you're pretty much covered here too. There are other beings. You know, uh, uh, aliens and, and things. Does this say that there are, I mean, does this have any, I mean, are there aliens? Does this show that there are no aliens? I mean, just yeah. because of nature, and, and I told you, mm -hmm. you probably, yeah, I mean, no, that's what, I, I think of that. When I think You're very gun shy this. these days after that first week, right? <laughs> <laughs> what did you say, Pastor? You're very gun shy after that first week. <laughs> I, I, like, I enjoy your questions. <laughs> One of the kids asked me that same question, one of the seventh graders, just a few days ago. And the reason I asked is yeah. I, I kind of feel like it ties into this. I mean, Well, what we know about the Bible, so now let's leave the natural knowledge of God, right? And you're Because you're asking a question that I'm going to have to refer to in revealed knowledge of God. There's nothing in the Bible that says there's aliens, nothing. And the way the Bible reads is, I, God, created, <coughs> and in my vastness of creation... My point is you, in my image, okay? We get that because we have the six days of creation, and one of the things that blows my mind big time about that is when God speaks about creating the stars on the fourth day, and... He says there's the, there's, the, there's, the, there's the sun, the greater light, and then there's the moon, the lesser light. And he talks about how important those two are, and we know how important those two are. If we didn't have either one of them, we would not survive. And as we learn about the cosmos and the universe, then he says after that, and God created the stars. And then he stops with that. Okay? So... What the Bible does say is the entire universe, all the vast creation, the entire universe got created, right? And that's where he stops with that. And he goes on to the next day. And he, the fifth day, he'll start talking about the fish and the birds. Then sixth day, land man. And then, and then what? Verse 26. Let us, oh, Trinity, we'll get there, make Man, in our image, the entire language changes. And the Hebrew in that is constructed in a way they don't normally do the Hebrew because Moses, whether he realizes it or not, is pointing to the Holy Trinity. Here's the point, though, for your, okay? You know the way that's written is 
<laughs> God creates, and I want him to talk about the stars. Why didn't he give me at least a couple of verses about the facets of the stars? Because when we research the stars and the galaxies that are out there, it is, it'll blow your mind, right? So, and that's why, you know, you look, there, there's the Psalms where, you know, look at the, look at the creation, of the glory of God in creation, right? And we could do that too. If I'm out camping or if I'm in Africa and we're at the safari and it's so dark and you look up in the sky, I look at nighttime and I'm praising God for the creation. So, Jesus, why don't you tell me a little bit more about those stars? And he doesn't. Because he wants to move to the important point of the, and that's you and me. So, in my opinion, and then chapter two is he's going to get up close and personal about Adam and Eve and how he took from the ground, breathed Adam, life into Adam, and then from the rib, Eve. And he talks about the relationship between Adam and Eve. That's where he goes with this thing. He leaves the stars behind. He just wants you to know he made the stars. So that's all part of creation. He's not talking about any other life out there or whatever. It's just his point of creation, according to the scriptures, is you. And if there are other living things out there, which I personally doubt very much, I think they're demons, by the way. Um, that's not how the Bible reads. The way the Bible reads is, I'm doing this all to create man in my image. All right? So there's nothing in the scriptures that I could see that lends itself to the idea of other living things that are out there. At the same time, God is giving us what I need to know too, right? Got to always remember that because a lot of people say, well, why doesn't God, well, I'm, I'm asking, why doesn't God tell me about the stars? Well, we're discovering about the stars, but it'd be really nice to hear his, his point on it. He doesn't. There's a lot of things that he doesn't tell us. So the Bible doesn't concern itself with everything. The, God, the Bible concerns itself with our relationship with God and how we're going to be redeemed through Jesus, see? So if, if, if one says, well, there's probably life out there somewhere else, I don't think you get it from Scripture. That's not to say that there isn't, but it doesn't read that way, okay? And just a, just a, a, a note on that, this idea that what people are seeing, because I do think people are seeing things out there. I, I just know that. I know some people who saw things, and I trust them. Um, and a lot of the things that they're seeing out there defy physics. And I've researched pretty much every denomination, including our own, will come to conclusions that that's demonic stuff that's out there. Demons manifesting in ways. It, it, what, what's very interesting is I hear that everywhere, including Lutherans, including my own professor, Professor Mark Corp, um, who is a solid systematic guy. And he said that way back when I was in seminary. There's demonic activity out there. And that was supposed to increase in the last days. Interesting, isn't it? I, want to get too, I don't want to get too adrift, but huh? Yeah. Like the like uh, when the United States used red for night vision, and we kept seeing stuff, supernatural stuff. Mm -hmm. the war. Yeah. And so they switched to green. Oh, okay. That's all why. Right. That's why it's green. That's why it's green. Because huh? you had so many soldiers seeing all this demonic supernatural stuff. Yeah. You know, some people say it's aliens and stuff, but yeah, from from it's very interesting how theologians conclude demonic activity. I just thought it was a box that said none of your business. Maybe, and you know, other people say it's and some of that is uh, you know technology that's being hidden from us. That's a possibility too. Yes. At the same time, I think people see things that aren't there, too. You've got to throw that in the mix, too. Yeah. yeah. Kids are really interested in that one. They go off. We go off in tangents with that. But we, I just, <laughs> I just, uh, yeah, that, okay. But back to where I want you, where I want you is, right? Natural knowledge of God and the two things that we all can agree on, all of us around the world. 
Right. There's a God in life sense. Yep. That's how I like to do it. Kind of, and then you die. <laughs> right. So, so, but just think, think about what happens. Like, take away just your Christianity for a second. And if those two things, you're going to have all kinds of questions about who this God is, right? And if you're not led to the true God who loves you, in other words, by the revealed knowledge of God, you're going to come up with all these ideas about God that aren't true. And you're definitely going to come up with a works righteousness idea of getting to God. That is for sure. And lo and behold, every religion outside of true Christianity, that is the common denominator. To which Luther says what? It's the head of the serpent. It's the great deceit of the serpent. It's what brings about our arrogance and our pride. The idea that I can somehow attain some kind of moral equivalent to now I am being accepted by God because I passed some kind of test. Which makes absolute sense to all of us because that's how we live our lives in this economy. Right? Okay? Any other questions? I already told you that. Who, oh, does anybody agree with me? Do you agree? I, I, anybody else? I would I mean, disagree with you. You were going to disagree with me? Yeah. Okay. All right. And only because I, I grew up with a guy in high school that I really believe he is. He believes there really is no such thing as a God. And uh, it's a byproduct of his dad shooting his mom and shooting his grandmother and shooting himself in front of him and his brother when they were in private school. Mm -hmm. And he really, mm -hmm. really. Maybe the devil's advocate just, anymore. yeah, but doesn't that make sense that you would then say there is no God if you can't make sense of that, but you still, in the end, no? I don't know. I okay. I've known him all my life, and he still hasn't come around. I've known him since oh, I'm not saying they come around. You know? Yeah, a lot of them don't come around. Okay, yeah, fair enough. I, I just, that's not something I'm going to fall my sword with. But, you know. they, a lot of them argue with the argue that there is a God. They'll talk about God and they'll be mad at God. They never argue from the stance that, you know what I mean? Like, they, they're, it's, it's, you can see it when you do it, that they're, there's... That's an excellent point. There's, there's right. something in their argument that's resentful and they're upset with somebody. They are that preoccupied with the God. Don't... They're preoccupied with the God they don't believe in. Right. And that doesn't make sense to me. I think there are some people that are maybe, I think in, there's the person who's indifferent about everything and doesn't really care and doesn't contemplate it. But I still, I agree with you. Yeah? I think it depends on how you define God. Okay. They don't believe there's a... I think they would maybe acknowledge there's something greater, but it's not good. Okay. That makes, okay. So All they right. would not call it God because God insinuates something good and something I want to go to. All right. So, so this entity out there is in by nature evil. Yes. Or indifferent. And which so, indifferent would have to be evil because if I saw you like on the street dying and I didn't do and I was indifferent on that, that would be evil, right? So the sin of omission versus commission. I'm sorry. Atheists that I know would say that this is hell, this life is hell, and they don't want there to be an afterlife because or God, right? Life is awful. Yeah. Why would I want to continue awful? Yeah. Okay. Um, so they, what we, I find that hard to grasp because when I say God, when I say life, when I say concepts like heaven. Um, or life after death, we think of them as positive things. Um, and it's hard to see it from their perspective where there's absolutely nothing positive about any of those words. Uh -huh. So yes, they, 
I do think they believe in something. Ken Ham from Ark Encounter, he okay. would say that they say they don't have, they don't believe in anything, but what they believe in is that there is no God. That is in itself what I believe. Okay. All right. So you're kind of saying there is no God like the one we believe in. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. All right, so it's important to understand that the natural knowledge gives us a very broad definition, and so there's all kinds of religions out there. We're going to try to break that up. Um, and so we've settled the God is or God isn't, okay? So I'm going to just skip ahead here because we went over this, right? There's a second one. The first one, there's a God. The second one is everyone believes life is rough and then you die. And we already went to this, which is which is the extent of works righteousness that, uh, you know, the whole sacrificial thing that pagans have done and we still do today. So climb the ladder to God, and now we're going to start getting into it, okay? Um, at first I got to define something called pantheism, all right? Pantheism. Pantheism is the belief that the cosmos or universe and deity are the same, big part of it, okay? So what you're going to get when you start talking about pantheism, uh, this, this is where you gotta put your thinking caps on, okay? It's gonna get a little rough here, but let's just think this through. If, you're a, if you believe in pantheism, you believe in kind of a benign God that's out there is that entity out there that is the fullness of the universe and all of creation. And, and, and in the end, if you're like a Hindu or something like that, you actually believe everything is God, your God, but you just, you have not discovered your divinity yet. And it might take you another hundred or a thousand reincarnations till you become one with the absolute, okay? So when we get from pantheism to what we call polytheism, and polytheism is the belief in many gods, polytheism, right? Polytheism. What you're going to get is there is an entity out there, like a divine absolute entity that really doesn't care one way or the other, but it's there. And then underneath it is a bunch of gods. This is where things get played out amongst the divine, the gods, plural. And that's what we call polytheism, right? You, you with me? So the idea, if you're a polytheistic or a pantheist, and the pantheists are, pantheism is, is really, and polytheism are both intertwined together. They just have two different definitions. But you can't, if you're a pantheist, you're going to be a polytheist for the most part, okay? So you're going to focus on what? Not that thing that's out here. You're going to focus on all the different gods. That's where the thing gets played out. That's where, that's where the, that's where things happen. So think of this benign whatever. And then you have a bunch of different gods, usually at war with each other or having sexual relations with each other. And the thing is, relations, by the way, there are relationships being drawn from these gods. And that's what we're going to focus on. Okay. Yes. Yes, but when you get to monotheism, see, it, it's like the, the way they think is okay. There's the whole universe. There's the whole this thing. They don't even try to grasp what that is. That's why I try to maybe is my, maybe the word benign. Does that make sense? This is this is where you don't really get in contact with that. It just exists. So and from a pragmatic standpoint, you're not dealing with it. 
you're dealing with the gods. Okay, because this, there, there's no, uh, so in one sense it's monotheistic in the end because you, you're still that guy with the natural knowledge of God that says, look at the universe, there must be something bigger than me. Right? Back to the natural knowledge of God. Now when they're defining it, you compare this, so let's just jump to the monotheistic religions like Judaism, the main ones are Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. If you even take, say, the Islam God, they're going to look at God. You're going, your, your relationship is with that God, direct, monothe. And so the idea of one God is really extremely important when it deals with your life, salvation, and reality. And, and, and how that God is going to relate to you. All right? Does that make sense? Yes? So can theism would be more like the belief that all nature is God. So you, you know, the sky is part of your sacred, the sky is sacred, the ground is sacred, the stars are sacred. So I yes. mean, that's kind of like what pagans and American Indians. Exactly. So yeah. I mean, the, the, the circle of life was kind of... Right. Right. Their religion. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and if let's say let's say you're out in the ocean and you know this guy the nature is happening, this is all, you know, that divine entity, but you might have to deal with Poseidon. <laughs> Something like that, you know what I mean? That's that's where they start defining the relationship. They, they, it's not even practical for them to go to that thing that is just beyond us, because in the end it's all God. That's just how they think. It's the, you're probably having trouble with this because we as Christians don't think this way. Mm -hmm. All right. Yes. What did you say the definition of polyism is? Polytheism is just if if you think of poly, you think of many, right? The, if you interpret poly and theism is God, so many gods. Yeah. All right. I, I'm I'm telling you this so that when we start defining polytheism, that's where it's at. That's where the action is. <laughs> Does that make sense? That's what you're going to deal with if you're, yeah. Okay? Yes? Where would you place the New Age beliefs that where they believe largely that nature is um, is the universe, is like yeah. a power, mm -hmm. but they don't necessarily name gods, yeah. They think they are. It yeah. teaches that you are your own God. Right. Yeah, there's this direct relationship there. I didn't want to go there for the sake of where I'm going with the Holy Trinity. Okay. But since you ask, yes, there's a... Yeah, I always think of Shirley MacLaine. Remember Shirley MacLaine? Mm -hmm. If you're my age, you remember Shirley MacLaine, the actress, right? Mm -hmm. There's this one movie where... Because she was a New Age guru there, and she was big time in it, and she was in this movie where she's standing on the shore and she's yelling, she, I am God. There's that one scene where it was all about promoting this idea. And, and, and so it's very similar to Hinduism without all of the polytheistic thing, right? Yeah, very. And again, it's a benignness over there because what is she working towards in her meditative state and her proclamation that she is God, and it, oh, it's always so funny to me, like, what if a tidal wave came at that moment? <laughs> it's like, you're right, the ocean's right there. This great ocean that the real God, and you're trying to tell the ocean you're God? That ocean can swallow you up in a heartbeat. And there's no, you know, but to your answer, yes, it's a direct. So in the end, I'm going to become one with the absolute and so therefore I am God. Yeah, I think it became really popular a few years back. There was the movie, The Secret. Is that the one that she was in? A, no, I don't think so. Okay. Um, but that was a New York Times bestseller for almost a year. And Oprah promoted it. Oprah, yeah. And um, it is all about this idea of there is a universe. And they actually say in there, you can call it whatever you want to call it. Universe, Mother Nature, God, Allah, whatever, whatever you believe about it, 
all religions are equal in the sense that there is that thing. Yes. yes. But the yes. truth they're keeping from you is you is that's just energy in the universe that you can harness that's right. to alter the universe yep. to what you want it to be. Yes. Yes. And and what's interesting too, here we go. God is, God isn't, right? There are two religions. Okay, we just back up from all of it. Two religions in the world. That, Satanism, what does Satanism say? Um, what's their motto? Uh, Does God really say that? Yeah, that's started with it. Because this all does start, <laughs> it all starts there. Um, was it, uh, uh, Satanism is, uh, do what thou wilt is the whole of the law. All right, now just think about that. You got this Hindu who's trying to become one with the universe and she'll, she'll tell you, be kind and be good and you know, find your inner strength and all this stuff and it sounds pretty holy, kind of nifty and all that, you know? And it's works righteous. Take this, the, the, it's actually self-divinity, right? Well, the Satanist says, do what thou wilt is the whole of the law. They're acknowledging a law, but they're acknowledging pure subjectivity of it. So in other words, you're going to create the law. But just do what you want. Both of them tie to the serpent. You can have direct line to them, and the serpent was saying both of those, but they're both the same thing. It has some kind of sense of, of a works righteousness. For the Satanist, who's normally an atheist, it's you know, get it while you can for tomorrow you die. So pure subjectivity, which is you can be God. You can be your own God. Turn to the plane saying the same thing. See, Satan's got so many different ways in which to press your buttons. And all of them are what? Part of the same religion of works righteousness. Yes? Not to get off track, but wasn't there like a sect? early Christians that said there's hidden messages in the Bible and I thought we got the creed. Yeah, Gnosticism. Gnosticism. Yeah. You can see that John is already combating Gnosticism in his letter. <coughs> yes. And it's it it uh, it it yeah basically says that um, there's a hidden there's a lot of parts to Gnosticism, but to pertaining to our discussion here, it is that there is a hidden knowledge that you can attain. Therefore, Gnosticism from the Greek word kenosis, right? Yeah, and that's, that's very tied into it too. All focuses on the self, yeah, all right? So we got this understanding here because I'm gonna to move towards polytheism and leave pantheism behind I just want everybody to understand there's always this entity. Right. So here we go. I'm going to just read this to you who can't read it. My wife has criticized me because I didn't change this. It's too small. Some say Hinduism is one of the oldest religions that support pantheism, which is probably pretty true, which is the idea that everything is God and God is everything. See how that works? Well, now you got the universal God, singular, but it's benign in a sense, you know? Whatever you do to make yourself is gonna be about you and not this thing that's out there that is labeled God, see how I mean? Or divine. The Hindu school of philosophy, Advaita Vedanta, is thought to be similar to Western pantheism because it teaches that the human soul, the Atman, is the same as the unknown universe or Brahman. However, others argue that these claims are mistaken. Hinduism has both monotheistic, to Gary's point, monotheistic and polytheistic, monotheistic, one god, polytheistic, many gods, elements, and most forms of Hinduism are henotheistic, meaning they worship a single deity but also recognize other gods. 
I think you'll find when you study this, they're going. It, everything is going to be the the action is it with the other gods, with the gods, because that's where they put their time into it and when they have to develop gods, the the, the uh, Greek pantheon and all that stuff. Okay, I know this is getting heavy. What I'm, what, and and and, and uh, what I'm trying to do is get now to people's religions, okay, and the whole polytheistic idea, because I'm going to get something from the polytheistic idea, and I'm going to compare it to, in the end, the Trinity. Question? Okay. All right. Reincarnation is the, I already hit some of this stuff just by our discussion, but reincarnation is the religion, the religious or philosophical belief that the soul or spirit after biological death begins a new life and a new body that may be human, animal, or spiritual depending on the moral quality of the previous life's action. We talked about that, right? All right. So now, <laughs> what you get out of all of this, though, which is very important for us to understand, is uh, anybody know what this is? Yin yang. Yin yang. Yeah. Yin yang. Yeah. All right. What you're going to get, and this is really important, when you start when we start moving towards polytheism is that we end up with the belief, again, what are we asking? There's something divine and what? Life sucks and then you die, right? So how are we gonna define this? What's the answer? We're searching for the answer, the truth, right? So what the yin yang says is this, bad happens and good happens. You can go a little further and say, there's righteousness and there's evil, right? And they both need each other. They balance each other out. Kind of like, does the police officer want crime to go away because if it does, he'll lose his job. So he, I don't think he believes this, but <laughs> but you can almost like, um, so we need the evil and the good. And there's a balance that has to happen between the two in order for the balance of life. So they're dependent on each other. That's why you have this. Now, I should, probably should have picked a different one because this one normally, Actually, I should have. The point is, they need each other. Let's say this is good, all right? And let's just pretend this is black like this. So this is good, and there's evil within the good. And this is evil, but there's good within the evil. And there's this cooperation between good and evil. And they balance each other out. Why do you think Human beings came up with this. And keep in mind, there's something divine out there. I didn't make myself. And life is really rough and then you die. And you're trying to figure this out. Now you're not being led by the Holy Spirit because this is not real. This is not really the truth. But you're reasoning. You're, you're trying to figure it out. And let's, let's give them the benefit of the doubt, and I think we should. The person who comes up with this, let's say um, he's really trying to figure it out. Why would he come up with this? Justification. In what way? Who, who, who said justification? You did. Let me get your answer. I guess in the sense that, you know, People won't do good without there being a reason to do good, so therefore people won't do bad without there being a reason to do That's bad. That's very good. You say a little louder. People won't do good without a reason, you know, to, to do good, and people won't do bad without a reason to do bad things. Yeah. 
session. That, that you hit it, you pretty much, I think, nailed it here. So in order for me to be good, there's got to be something bad that shows that I'm being good. And I can't be good without the bad. So I'm going to need it to define my good. So you need evil to define good. Does something in the Bible tell you that's kind of creepy right now? <laughs> the knowledge of good and evil. Oh my goodness. This puts well, the hair in the back of my neck. It makes it stand up. Seriously. You, you're seeing religions being defined by the very thing that God tried to keep us away from. Right? You with me? How can I know you're good unless I know your counterpart? And why would that make sense to human beings? You got to kind of leave your don't leave your Christianity, but leave what you know about God and his goodness and just come from the bottom up. You kind of nailed it there, but why would somebody come to that conclusion? In what way does it make sense? It does. It does make sense. It does make sense. Okay, so let's, are you guys ready with this? Okay, so it does. It absolutely does by my experience in life. And I'm back to the police officer who needs there to be evil in order to have his job. It's bigger than that, but that's kind of the thinking, right? And what goes into my mind is this. The knowledge of good and evil was present there, right? God didn't want us to have the knowledge of good and evil. He had everything toe in harmony with God that had nothing to do with evil. He did not want evil. But now you and I definitely have the knowledge of good and evil, right? A guy, um, a lady's trying to, an old lady's trying to cross the street and someone clobbers her. You call that what? Evil. Evil. Another guy helps her across the street to make sure she gets across safely. You call that good. You have a knowledge of good and evil, which God didn't want us to have. But man says what? It'd be better off if we had a knowledge of good and evil. In order for what? Me to be like God. So we have to introduce evil and a knowledge of evil so that I can understand what is good, so that I can be God. That's what the devil has fed us. What does the Bible say? I'm getting into the revealed knowledge of God, but I have to. When God created, after each day of creation, it was, the, the Hebrew word is tov, which not only means good, which you read in your Bible, it means in harmony with God. Perfectly God. It's Godness. It's all good. And that's what God wanted. Okay? So the idea of coming up with yin-yang makes all the sense in the world that humans outside of the Holy Spirit would come up with that because it does make sense in our world. Because it's how I live. It's how you live. It's how your economy is. So people take advantage of other people in this economy of ours. People take advantage of each other in relationships. You divorce that guy because he was a jerk. And you identify the evil and the good thing would be to get rid of him. You, you, could, you could do this all day long because this is how we exist so you can understand how it makes sense. But what are you, what's the problem here? You're back to your justification. What are you justifying? Or just plain what? You're justifying evil. As opposed to what God says when he creates everything is good, now you and I say we build religions 
justifying evil. Okay? Now let me just take this one more step. Justifying Say, that it has to exist? Yeah. So we should be good with it. We should put the guy in prison because of his evil, but we still have to thank him for ultimately showing my good because it's dependent on each other. So, you know, all of our, just all of our ideas on how to exist outside of the true gospel of Jesus Christ is going to have this in one way or the other, whether you like it or not. All right? I'm going to just jump over to Islam and say, what does Islam believe? They believe in one God, but what do they believe? The more good things you do, if, you're, if your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, you go to heaven. If your bad deeds outweigh your good deeds, you go to hell. As if it was a Detroit Tiger, New York Yankee baseball game, and the Tigers win four to three. If the Tigers have four runs and the Yankees have three, who gets the W? Tigers, who gets the L? The Yankees. Right? And that's how we that's how we live. The Yankees still had three. The Yankees still had three what? Points. It, but it just so happens the Tigers had four. Okay? So let's say um, I go, the four of us go fishing. You guys all for some reason, a wave hits us and the three of you fall out of the boat and a great white shark eats you. <laughs> and I didn't, do, I didn't do anything to help you. I just watched it. And I could have maybe helped you, but I didn't. All right? The next week, we go fishing. One, two, three, four. Big wave hits the boat. The four of you fall off the boat because of the wave. I'm remorseful over this, so I throw you guys life jackets and I save your lives and no sharks. Four to three, I'm good. Works righteousness. See? Uh, huh? So that makes way more sense. But it's all the same thing. You have evil, and you have good. And what God is, is good. God never wanted us to have a knowledge of good and evil. Our knowledge of good and evil is tied to self divinity, which is what this is all headed to and what we've all been talking about. And they're all forms of works righteousness. Right? Because the thing is, I have to deal with my, what, if, if there's a divine out there, how are you guys feeling if I won the ball game here and you guys are dead? There's no, you know, but as long as I have more good deeds than bad deeds, right? What does Jesus say? At the end of when he gives us the Sermon on the Mount, what does Jesus say? What's the truth of the matter? He ends the Sermon on the Mount with, Be perfect, for the Lord your God is perfect. He's not looking for a score of four to three. He's not looking, up at, he's looking at life as a balance between good and evil to define good. Good is not dependent on evil at all. But every one of our ways of righteousness depends on evil. That's why we know works righteousness is the head of the serpent. In every one of the religions that I'm showing you, and I'm now showing you the yin-yang, that they're dependent on each other. The idea that if you were to remove the evil, the good would not exist. Think about that. That means evil has virtue. Does evil have virtue? No. What, how would you define evil? As opposed to the, the balance of good, how would you define evil? The absence of good. The absence of good. It's 
the absence of good. Now you understand why there needs to be a hell. And hell is a reflection of the righteousness of God. I'm just throwing that one in there. Let's not talk about that too much. But I just, it's true. What, what Christianity provides that no other religion provides is when God creates, it's good. When we disobey him, it's bad. And if that were the end of it, I deserve hell for eternity. But God is good. And the redemption that comes from God is not a dependence on evil at all. It's a destruction of evil and death. Through he who is good, who created everything good and then redeems through that same goodness. So God put the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden for? Testing. He tested Adam and Eve. He said, don't do it or you will die. And then Satan tempted. And that's, so what, that's what always is happening with you and me too. God is always testing us through evil. And when evil things happen to us, he's testing us. God is always tempting. Uh, no, God is always testing. Satan is, te is tempting. God is trying to purge you from the evil, which is also, so in my, in my daily walk with the Lord, if something bad happens to me, um, he's testing me, he's testing my faith, and ultimately he, he uses evil for good through his goodness, because he, he's, he's good, good. But then Satan is always tempting me to leave God and have the same philosophy that God doesn't care or that. You have a question. I always wonder if Adam and Eve never sinned or never ate the apple. Right. They would be, I, in my opinion, gods. Not, not God. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying I believe this, but um, there would be other people that would make them God. I think. So God, I think God had a plan. That no, I don't think they would have been God, but they would have lived in the image of God which would be just as good as that because the image of God would be what? God is giving you, when we define the image of God, it's his righteousness. So he would, and that's why he had to, by the way, make a choice. Man was not a computer program, right? Right? So I, mean, I always tell the kids, because uh, they always ask that question, why did he put the, gar the tree in the garden? And the reason why he put the tree in the garden to test us is because we're not, we're not, programmed robots you know right I don't know if you remember back in the day I would always say well if you wanted a perfect wife that was programmed to be a perfect wife or a perfect husband would you take the programmed robot who really doesn't have a conscience and does not feel love but they would be they would do every, say everything right do everything right <laughs> wash the dishes without complaining or take out the garbage without complaining do everything perfect. Would you want that program robot? And of course, the answer is no. That was actually a movie. Huh? That was actually a movie, The Stepford Wives. The Stepford Wives, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But he, he, he had to test man. He took a risk when he made us in his image. Yeah. I don't think we would become gods but we would live with the image of God. It's almost as if we, you know, we would be created beings worshiping God and having all the benefits of God. And we threw all that away. Was there another question over here? I thought I saw another hand go up. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Um, kind of backtrack a little bit when you talk about like the scales of good and evil. But why, why then at the end of the Athanasian Creed do we say those who have done good will question. Yeah. I hate it ending that way, but it does. You're going back to Athanasian, Athanasius, and he's not post, I guess I gotta say this carefully, he's not post-Reformation like you and I are. Okay? So we still have more slide 
No, he's not. Because he, in the end, what, what he is doing is basically saying what it says in Matthew when God, when, when basically Matthew says at the end, the, those who have done good go to heaven and those who've done bad go to, go to hell, the sheep and the goat, or the sheep and the goat, yeah. And Charles, I got a lesson that for last week and this week. Exactly. So you do do good works. We talked about that last week. And what, what, what does the Lutheran say first and foremost about good works? You're not saved by them, but you do do good works. The problem with the Lutheran often is I'm not saved by works. My works don't get me to heaven. And then we, we take works and we put it, we make it down here less important. Right? So those who do good are who? You don't do perfect good, but you, the, the, the one who's done good is who? Perfect good is Jesus, right? But you, it also mentions that you get rewards in heaven for the good works that you do, and you, you meet up with people who do good works and affect your life because of them. So if you're looking at it, you're not looking at it from the perspective of the Apostle Paul like Lutherans like to look at it, right? By grace you've been saved through faith, not by works lest any man should boast. Uh, you can also look at, and this is, where, this is where even Luther himself had a problem, and that would be James, who says faith without works is dead. You will be going to heaven. Stay with me here, okay? Please, Jim, stay. You will go to heaven because of your works. From one, from if you look at it from one sense, and that's where you have the rewards for works because you do do them. But you're not you're not doing them for, in and of from yourself. You're doing works, as I said, like the ladder that goes this way as opposed to this way. So we all do good works in response to the gospel, and God is going to give you the credit for that, for those works. You didn't earn it by those works. They naturally flow from what? From Jesus himself and his works, just as Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the what? Branches. Right? But he's saying, you're abiding in me in faith, Right? The source of all good works is Jesus, but if you're abiding in me, you will produce good works. And then God gives us the credits for our good works. Like Abraham. Yes. It was credited to him as righteousness. All right. So Athanasian is, is he saying he's saying you're going to he's, he's looking at it from that perspective, which is hard for us Lutherans because we are so for good reason. We don't want to put our works as being in any way credited to us for our salvation. But they are going to be credited to you because of the grace of God and you're going to be given rewards for them. Well, it just says that there, the reward, there are rewards that will come. How that works, I don't know. Would you say just blessings in life? Well, I think that, well, again, remember this. So everyone here, who, who here has had the Moses experience? In other words, did God, you know, do to you like he did to Moses when all of a sudden there's this miracle of a burning bush, but the, you know, every campfire I've been at, I always have to throw in more wood, right? Because the wood burns. Well, Moses saw a burning bush and the bush was not burning it wasn't being disintegrated right how many of you had that experience Moses did so there was a direct thing going on with God and through a miracle right how did you become a Christian first answer from the Lutheran the Word of God absolutely true all right how did that get to you Parents, who else? Yeah, every one of you that are here, because you're in Bible study, I know that you could write a list of people that influence you with the gospel. Everyone here, you could write your list, right? How important were those people in your life? It was the difference between heaven and hell. See how that works?
So it, it's just a beautiful thing that God's grace is so big because my, if my, I, what I would do, I would, I would think that God should have a, um, I think all of us should have the burning bush experience, right? I don't think he should use you to get to me, Jim, should he? Eric? Actually, God says, no, I want to use Jim and Eric and everybody here to get to me. I want that fellowship to happen. If this is Our fellowship with each other is just as important to God as our fellowship with him. That's, that's for sure. So what does God do? <coughs> he uses you to get to me with the word of God, through your words and your actions, or through your suffering. All right? I just got done talking to somebody um, who's suffering and really would like to go. And I had to remind that individual who thinks he or she is a burden to his or her family and wants to relieve his or her family's burden. And I told them, you have no idea how you are affecting your family professing Christ while you die. All right? And how many of you have had that experience with a loved one? I've had it with my father, my mother, uh, my grandma. But we have that, right? So God is working through us. These, 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 these are going to get rewards. But it's interesting when, when they're doing it, they're not thinking about rewards, are they? That's the last thing on their mind, that they're going to get rewards. Because God uses you to get to me. He doesn't give me the burning bush. That answers something to me, doesn't it? Because what does that do with you and me? That means I have something with you that I didn't have with my Uncle Ralph, who, 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 who was an atheist, and I, he's died recently. I hope a miracle happened where but uh, uh, he's always professed, nope, he's one of the atheists. Well, I think belief in God, but he just suppressed it. But then again, maybe I'm not right. See where I'm going with this, though? I, my relationship with everyone in this Bible study is much closer than my relationship with my uncle, who I loved very much, and he was a great guy but I didn't have any kind of spiritual connection with him, nor would he receive the gospel. And he definitely didn't give me the gospel because he didn't believe it. See how that works? Does this answer that? So, and then, so when you think about the Athanasian Creed, he's emphasizing the importance of good works. And we as Lutherans should not be afraid of that. And we're not mixing this into that, right? I didn't, my dad did not earn salvation by when he was dying, told me David um, to live as Christ and to die as gain. All right. Doing good work shows love. That didn't, that didn't save him. It maybe helped save me through, right? See how that works? We as Lutherans got to stop this idea that works are some kind of a subcategory in our Christian faith. I think we have a big problem with that. And I think within the Lutheran church, that's what causes a lot of the apathy of the Christian church. Because being saved by grace becomes a license to be lazy. Now, if you're being lazy, and I told you that, and you go, okay, I'll start working on being a good Christian and start working and doing things. I don't want that either. God doesn't need you then. He doesn't need you. But the fact that we have been saved by grace is the greatest motivator to good works that, that exists on the face of the earth. I'm not getting twisted my arm or anything, but Jesus loves me that much, and I want you to know that, even with even though I have a this this terrible sinful nature that makes me lazy. Does that answer the question? Kind of? Yeah. We should have we should have no problem with that. And here's the other thing too. I'll end with this. I think we're you read I just nah I'm not gonna go there. <laughs> I told you. Read Luther's sermons. I got these volumes of Luther's sermons. He ends with works a lot, and I wasn't taught that way at seminary. Huh. And and if any, and he's the guy who what brought grace by faith back to the church. 
But there's times that he's emphasizing, you know, and I know like sometimes I got to go to the seminary to preach. And that's when I get, you know, because I got all these professors, all my idols are there, the guys who really know this stuff. That, and and uh, so I got to make sure what? I give them what I was taught. <laughs> and then I'll, then, I'll, then I'll look at, uh, was I in that? Then I'll, oh, uh, but I'll, I'll do it how it is taught, but it's very interesting to see how Luther sometimes ended with law, <coughs> works. Isn't there a cliche that goes something like, you're not saved by good works, you're saved for good works? <coughs> All right. I, what, I, what I think is true is you are saved by grace and judged by works. Does that make sense? No? I throw it away. Just throw it away. <laughs> Seriously, I shouldn't end that way, but since you say that, that would be my opinion. And that came from, uh, yeah, one of my professors, actually. Yeah, let's not go there. Now we're getting, yeah. Yeah. I think it's our justification and our sanctification. So we're justified by Christ. Mm -hmm. Because we're justified by Christ, we, as Luther says, we can't but do the good works because we have this great mercy and grace that he has given us. Right. And, and, yeah, that, you're, you're absolutely right. And if, you, and if you define justification, what how do you define it? It has been what? has been declared to you. Yeah. See, that's yeah. totally right. It's been declared to you by Christ and by his righteousness. Go ahead. Yeah. So then we have the fruits of the Spirit mm -hmm. that come to us. Uh, like you were saying, that I think of the tree. The mm -hmm. vine is Christ and we're the branch and we produce the fruits. And then the fruits distribute mm -hmm. the good, the love, joy, peace, the very gospel, yeah. all of yeah. that yeah. to other people. Right, right. That's a good way to put it, too. Your sanctified life con convey conveys the uh, the gospel to me and others. Yeah. Christ himself did so many good works. What? Christ himself did so many good He works. is good works, man. Yeah. He is He is the one who's perfect, yeah. His whole life was right. giving to others. So our, our works are because of grace. <laughs> it's not because of our own righteousness. See how that works? Man, I'm going to have to speed up a little here because i got <laughs> lots more to go. But uh, One of the things we want to conclude here with the yin-yang is what? True goodness is not dependent on what? Evil. All right? True goodness is not dependent on evil. And there are religions, all false religions, really try to build evil as part of it. The other thing I don't like about it is it's that they're in balance. They're, like it's 50, they're saying it's balanced, yep. 50% good and 50% bad. And I think exactly. And it's the belief that if you took away even a part of that evil, the balance would be, and that would be negative. Right. Yeah. Or, or if you look at that as being yourself, you go like, well, geez, I'm 50 bad, 50 good. It's like any day, it's like, am I going to heaven? Am I going to hell? Uh, uh -huh. you know, I don't know. It's like it could go either way. Right. Or, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay, let's pray. Hopefully you'll come back next week. Are we getting we're getting it though? It's just driving it. We're getting really deep on these things and uh, but it's really important. Uh, stick through me to the end. You're gonna understand why the Trinity has to be true. Not is it true, it has to be this way. And then when you look through the Trinity back to everything, it makes sense. Okay. Dear Lord, thank you for our time together and um, help us, especially in our confusion. And something that we have to understand is that you are much bigger than us and your revelation is beyond us and where we don't understand, we are your children. And uh, I pray that you be with all of us as we continue in this study uh, that we can recognize the one true God who created us and redeemed us.
by works of you, who is the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in essence, one God, uh, and help us to have a good night's sleep tonight and have sweet dreams and no nightmares over this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I worry a lot about that.